but as the as a way of breakthrough, like I said, um, Sir Alexander Fleming in the year 20, 1928 came across a very sudden uh, situation that happened in his, in his laboratory, and this led to uh, the discovery of the first antibiotic, which is penicillin. If you look at the diagram below, uh, this diagram, we have uh, that's penicillium notatum, that is the fungus, you know, uh, that produced this first antibiotic, which is, that is why the name came, you know, became penicillin from the name penicillium notatum. And that was in the end of it. Uh, for this breakthrough, Salen, uh, Alexander Fleming you know, in 1945 uh, won a Nobel Prize for that particular discovery. As if that was not the end, uh, in an interview shortly after he won this particular Nobel Prize, the same 1945, you know, uh, he said, and I quote, the thoughtless person playing with penicillin treatment is morally responsible for the death of the man who succumbs to infection with the penicillin resistant organism. To me, I felt immediately Sir Alexander Fleming got um, his Nobel Prize. He, will, he tried to warn the world at large. If care is not taken, there's still, there's going to be a problem of resistance. And this was what he meant by this particular statement. And years after years, we are beginning to see the emergence of antibiotic resistance. Yes. So um, to start with, we, you know, looking at the topic we have antimicrobials. Yeah, people are, uh, people are, I got to understand that in this platform, we have um, science-oriented persons and even non-science-oriented persons. So I'm, I'm trying, as, I'm gonna try as much as possible to be very, very simple with the terms that I'm using. Yes, I won't take you too much into much of a scientific terminologies. So antimicrobials, the, it's the compound word, is a compound word that talks about, um, you know, the medicines that, you know, we use in treating infections. But the term antimicrobial is, can be divided into four basic um, subgroups. So we have antibiotic, which is antibacterial, antivirals, which are, are antimicrobials that work against viruses. Then we have antifungals, which are uh, which are working against uh, active against antifung uh, sorry fungi. Then we have antiparasites. But for the sake of uh, uh, this presentation, I will dwell more on, on antibiotics, which is um, a more common you know um, term, especially because we are dealing mostly with bacteria. Um, so a lot of people are so more familiar with bacteria. So I, I, I'm going to be dealing more on antibiotics um, this evening. So antibiotics can be simply described as medicines, um, you know, used for treating infections, infections that are caused by bacteria. Just like I said, antivirals are used against anti, um, viruses, while right? antifungals are against uh, fungi. But in the case of bacteria, we are, um, the, the medicines, you know, uh, basically work against this set of uh, organisms, uh, antibiotics. And so therefore, uh, it is acting only against antibiotics, sorry, bacteria. Then uh, yeah, I, I list an example of common antibiotics because why did I have to list this? Uh, in, an, in a recent uh, questionnaire, I actually you know, sent a kind of review and I discovered that uh, quite a lot of people don't even know what is, which of the you know, medicines you come across, which one is even antibiotics, which one is anti-inflammation, which one is, you know, Many people don't really know which drugs we're even talking about when we say antibiotics. So here yeah, yeah, are common, common antibiotics across Africa, uh, you know, uh, in Africa and around the world. We have erythromycin, it's a very common one, gentamicin, um, ciprotab, which many people see as, uh, you know, that is the generic name. Uh, sorry, that's the commercial name, ciprotab. You get to see ciprotlosazine, uh, that's coming from, uh, you know, the main generic that you know where ciprotab is actually coming from. Then you have septrine. A lot of people don't even know that septrine is an antibiotic. Uh, Amoxicillin, uh, metronidazole, which is known as flagyl. Many people consume flagyl. Linda, did they even know that flagyl 
is an antibiotic, same as tetracycline. So I just decided to put the common ones that where everybody is aware, uh, you know, at least we know all this, you know, we are familiar with these ones. So I uh, wouldn't want to digress from the main um, topic, which is antibiotics. As a matter of fact, they are natural. They can be natural, they can be synthetic or semi-synthetic. Yes, because um, they are produced, most of the antibiotics that we see today, you know, quite a number of them, talking about the material, the, the, the raw material through the, I mean, where these antibiotics actually are made from, they are natural, uh, you know, products from um, microorganisms, either fungi releasing some, uh, you know, uh, materials, you know, for which are actually later um, worked on, worked on, modernized, modified, and you know, for the purpose of treating other uh, ailments caused by bacteria. So antibiotics are not actually uh, totally syn synthetic, like it was made in the industry. The basics of antibiotics are most of them are natural, you know, uh, products coming from organisms. Organisms is uh, other bacteria or fungi, like I say, release these materials. You know, they have it as part of their metabolic, um, you know, uh, as, as a product of their metabolism in, in most cases. And so antibiotics is not totally uh, always seen as what you manufacture in the companies. Okay, so that is what I will first of all want us to understand. Then uh, going to my next slide. Yeah, just like I said earlier, antimicrobial resistance occurs when microbes. So um, talking about antimicrobial resistance now in its real form, we talked about antibiotics. We now know that antimicrobials, you know, are, are in four places where we have the uh, antibiotics as one of the subset, uh, you know, of antimicrobials. So antimicrobial resistance occurs when microbes develop mechanisms that protect them from the effect of the drugs that were meant to kill them. Okay, so. Antibiotic resistance is simply now a, like I said, a subset. It's a sort of a VMR that applies specifically to bacteria that become resistant to antibiotics. So uh, I want to, first of all, I want to chip this in because I've seen quite a number of people say humans are resistant. I would love to make you understand the fact that humans don't become resistant to antibiotics. It is the bacteria, infectious agents, that become resistant. If um, they are, I will shed more light on this. So, what are the recent um, facts about EMR across the world, across the globe? You know, recently, that was uh, earlier this year, 2022, there was a publication by the, uh, on, in Lancet that talked that, that, that gives an account of about 1.27 million uh, EMR associated deaths in the year 2019. What does this simply mean? It means that in the year 2019, uh, a lot of deaths occurred across the surface of the earth, I mean, across the globe, but 1.27 million of, among these deaths were associated with AMR. Yes, so that was the finding, that was what we found, which was actually, uh, immediately this report came out, it was so um, scary. Yeah, because prior to this, 2019, in the year 2016, the uh, O'Neill, yes, John O'Neill and his team had already done a kind of, uh, you know, uh, estimate, and by their estimation, it was not supposed to be 1.27 million. By their estimation, they were looking at about 700,000 deaths every year, but that was 2016. Only to find in the year 2019, that it has increased now to 1.27 million associated deaths. So it was alarming, like I said, scary. So it tells us that the problem of antibiotic resistance, it's, uh, it's, a, it, it's a big problem, yes. And how, we got, how it became so big, we are gonna see, um, and how we can stem it. I would also like, I would also mention because of this, um, presentation. So according to O'Neill, like I said, his prediction was that in by the year 2050, looking at the trend in year 2016, using the trend in 2016, 
to predict the trend by the time we get to 2050. Is on, is the, their, their conclusion was that three persons will, continue, will die. They were recording about three deaths every 10 seconds by the year 2050 as a result of AMR. If care is not taken, if we are not, um, we are unable to, you know, stem the continuous spread of AMR. So if we could predict that as, as a 2016, I'm sure if you go by the report we got in 2019, automatically that would have increased by 2050. We will not be expecting three deaths, maybe more deaths uh, every 10 seconds by that time. So uh, this is not to scare us. This is just to make you understand the fact that the problem of AMR is not um, a future problem. It is already here. If as of 2019, we were able to record this much um, AMR associated deaths. Okay, so in this side of the slide, uh, it will talk about about the resistance. It does not only uh, apply to hospitals or healthcare facilities uh, or human health per se. Uh, there's a, a, a cross contamination, there's a cross spread of AMR in agriculture, in uh, human health and health facilities, even in the environment, in the soil, in the water, in um, rivers, as much as we see. A lot of people, you know, looking at uh, the way people dump refuse or companies releasing effluent into the environment, all these are playing a vital, they are playing vital roles, you know, in developing and continuous, uh, continuously allowing the spread of AMR. So, uh, this is just a, 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 a highlight, you know, to tell that AMR uh, or, or antibiotic resistance in particular is a problem that is inherent in our environment, not just, like I said, not just in the hospitals, don't look at it like it's only in the hospitals or only in the agricultural sector, but it is all encompassing. Yeah, so, uh, which means we have to take more care and more you know, cognizance when it comes to uh, the issue of the antibiotic resistance. resistance. Yes, uh, so here is a, a slide that is telling us, um, so a slide that is showing how antibiotic resistance, you know, how it comes to be. Yes, because it's a continuous process. Bacterial resistance towards antibiotics, like I said, can be natural. Because we're talking about the natural science, like okay, antibiotic resistance is not a, is not a fiction. It's a natural science. It's a natural process. Even if you if you decide not to use antibiotics, uh, if you decide not to abuse antibiotics, if you decide to be very very cautious, if you decide to take things and follow the rules or, or, or you know that guide living in an antibiotics, uh, you will uh, you will never stop antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance is a natural process. And how is it natural? It can be natural, like I said, it can be, it can also be acquired. Okay, so but now tell me about the natural part of it. It is, um, I, I, from research, from our understanding, we come to realize that antibiotics are, let's look at the synthetic and semi-synthetic antibiotics that are produced in our, you know, from the companies, our uh, manufacturing companies. We, they, these antibiotics are, designed in such a way that they target particular sites in each of the antibiotics, sorry, in each of the bacteria or infectious agents that we, I mean, that, that, that is needed to cure or needed to take care of. So antibiotics are designed in such a way that they attack a particular section or a compartment or a, or, or, or a region or a unit of a particular bacterial okay so they don't um all antibiotics do not work the same way that's what i'm trying to say all antibiotics we have several classes of antibiotics all of them do not work the same way uh i'll be showing you how you know the ones um the different classes and how they get to work okay all of them do not work the same way so you don't expect them to 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 take care of the antibiotic the bacterial infection that you know, across board, okay? So like I said, they are specific in their, in their reaction. So you don't expect the antibiotic A to take care of 
uh, infection A and, and they still expect antibody B to also work the same way to, uh, to take care of infection A. There are different ways and different channels through which these antibodies work. Okay, well, uh, I, let's looking at the natural aspect of it. Uh, there are natural, there are a lot of things that happen naturally. For example, uh, the way bacteria are designed, we have two major groups of bacteria. Okay, this is supposed to be an exposi expos exposition. We have two different major groups of bacteria. We have those we call gram positive bacteria. We have those we call gra cause gram negative bacteria. They differ in their structures. The group that are called bacteria are gram positive, they have structures, cellular structures that are different from those of the gram negative. Okay, so antibiotics that are designed in such a way that they will attack the gram positive, you cannot expect them all the time to be able to work effectively on the gram negative organisms and vice versa. So naturally, if, you, if, if there's an infection that is caused by a gram positive organism, and unfortunately, somebody goes to for self-medication and self-prescription as the case may be, decides to use an antibiotic, which was specifically designed to attack a gram negative organism. Automatically, that infection remains because uh, like in self-prescription, it's not as if the, the, I mean, the person doesn't even know which antibiotics or which organism is he using it against. So these are the, one of the reasons to prove that antibiotic resistance will always be natural organisms that are, that are, that are resistant naturally, that are naturally resistant to, to some antibiotics. It's a natural process, okay? Organisms like enteric organisms, most of the enteric organisms like uh, uh, Escherichia coli is a very common one. You will not expect to use the antibiotics uh, that is specifically designed for staphylococcus to come and work against Escherichia coli. Yes, it will not work because there are two different groups of bacteria. There are two different groups. So this is one of the factors. This is one of the reasons to prove to us that antibiotic resistance is a natural process. It's a natural thing. It keeps happening. The only thing we as individuals can do is to mitigate the spread, is to try to reduce it. You cannot eradicate it, okay? If at inception, Alexander Fleming has even predicted it, that it, if you continue to play with these antibiotics, you will end up having resistance. He knew, he knew that antibiotic resistance cannot be, you know, can, 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 cannot be uh, done away with. It is a natural process, it will surely come. But how do we manage it is what uh, you know is the responsibility of everybody uh, you know across this across the globe. So talking about mutation, uh, mutation is a response. It's kind of response that microorganisms generally, not even bacteria alone, you know, how they respond. Right now, our world is crying, or crying, uh, you know, as a result of uh, climate change. There's increase increase in temperature, which is against the usual. Yes, these organisms, these bacteria, they also have to adjust. Yes, that's the truth. So as the, as the environment is changing, they will also adjust. And part of the adjustment is they begin to do some kind of modification in their system. So this kind of modification also, we promote their, the way they, they, they resist you know, antibiotics. So climate change, exposure to heavy metals, heavy metals in the environment, in fact, that is very common. For example, if you look at uh, electronic waste dump, the way people do it, the electronic waste dump site, I don't know if you have seen many, but I've come across a lot of electronic wastes. You know, the way it is heaped up, those metals, by the time they begin to degenerate one after the other, the, when the organisms, these bacteria, are exposed to this e-waste, for example, they begin to develop some resistance. And this resistance also, because of the gene that is responsible for this resistance, this also affects the way they respond to antibiotics. So this is the science, this is one of the science behind it. Exposure to heavy metals causes exposure to antibiotics. I mean, causes resistance to antibiotics. The same way herbicides, a lot of our farmers use herbicides today, pesticides, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
exposure to these materials we cause expose, we call them to naturally respond to these and because of this they become resistant to antibiotics so these are triggers we call it triggers so climate change triggers antibiotic resistance in bacteria heavy metals exposure to heavy metals you know, triggers it herbicides pesticides and very importantly subtherapeutic concentration of antibiotics for example many of us like i said are looking at people that do self prescription we were supposed to use let's say um, 10 milligram of antibiotics but because she did, did not uh, the doctor wasn't the one who predicted who, who prescribed you wouldn't know what dose what dosage to take and so you might end up taking you know a, a sub therapeutic concentration that is a, a concentration that will not kill the bacteria and so when you when they this bacteria are exposed to the small microgram or concentration of antibiotics it will not kill them instead they become familiar with it and when they become familiar with it when you even bring higher concentration they have already developed some kind of mechanism to resist it so this is also one of the factors that is responsible for antibiotic resistance and uh, let me move quickly to virtual i'm sorry vertical transmission it's just like a father i mean a mother giving birth to children yes a big a, a mother cell developing i mean producing daughter cells yes that is reproduction because of reproduction there is passage of genetic material from the mother to the daughters so this is also a natural process you can there's all you can do to all it it's a, it's a normal genetic process. Okay, so talk, talk about horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer, this usually happens when uh, uh, during mating, or we call it, that's why we call it conjugation. Okay, between, uh, one of these is conjugation between two bacteria cells. Okay, it's just like mating, male and female. Okay, so in the course of mating, there's also a transfer of genetic material, this genetic material is the gene. Just the way you and I have genes, so the gene that carry the resistance to certain type of antibiotics can be moved from one organism to another through that line of connection between these two organisms. So it, it also happens, it's a, it's a natural process. It also happens, yes, this one is not even mediated by maybe situation or climate change or, or heavy metal. It's a, is a normal thing, it's a normal process. There is always an exchange of genetic material, either plasmid, and uh, mostly plasmid actually. Uh, yes, plasmids that are carrying, you know, resistant genes are transferred from one bacteria to another. Okay, another one is transformation. Transformation is, uh, is, is also more, it's like um, conjugation, but the only difference now is that there is no coming together of two bacteria cells. Rather, they pick it up from the environment. There are a lot of resistant genes in the water, in the soil. You know, organisms just suddenly just pick it up. In fact, there are some particular special group of organisms. We call them Klebsiella. It's one of the leading organisms around the world today that easily releases resistant genes into the, into the, into the group or communities of bacteria. Wherever it belongs, it easily releases it. In, in fact, it's a, it's a very big donor. Yes, it's a very, very big donor, just like you have the whole positive or whole negative um, blood group kind of thing. So this is a universal donor, capsular pneumonia. It easily releases. It has a lot, so it has plenty. It's easy to release. So this is also one of the things. As they release, other organisms just pick it up from the environment. And before you know it, they start acting that way as well. Okay, then lastly is transduction. That is um, prophages, that is viral particles, viruses that attack um, you know, bacteria, picking up the genetic material of that particular bacteria, and they go to infect another bacteria. They take that gene, gene responsible for antibiotic resistance and put it in another organism, another bacteria. Okay, so that is, those are the things that usually just happen without, like I said, without anybody's intervention, without you playing a, a major role. It we surely it surely happens a lot in our environment, okay. So that's why I say this is a kind of natural processes that we cannot we cannot stop basically, except for some mechanisms that you know science scientists are actually doing around the world right now to put in place. 
Okay, uh, let me go to the next one. So antibiotics, naturally, they have potential to appear or function in three ways, okay? Once you have an antibiotic, it has three roles to play. Number one, as an antimicrobial agent, it must, of course, that is why we call it antibiotics. It must be able to, you know, act and inhibit or kill the bacteria that is targeting. So that is why it is an antimicrobial agent. It does number one, functional role of an antibiotic. Another thing is that it is an inducer of resistance against itself. What does it mean? Once an antibiotic come to existence, it, it has the potential to make another organism that sees that antibiotic to develop and to develop a kind of resistance to it. Like it's just like uh, they say when when A cause an effect, yeah. If there is no cause, there will not be effect. If there is no forward reaction, there will not be uh, reverse reaction, right? So if there is no antibiotics, organisms will not be thinking or be modifying themselves to try to resist it. So immediately an antimicrobial agent is produced. It is a potential inducer of resistance against itself. Another thing is that it doesn't only now cause resistance against itself because it doesn't only reduce, uh, induce resistance against itself, it also induces against other antibiotics. For example, once uh, as, I mean, as, a, as, a, as a bacteria has access to one antibiotic and was able to resist it, it's priming itself for another type of antibiotics that come. So other antibiotics that keep coming, either using different mechanisms, the bacteria has had one experience with one type of antibiotics in the past. Therefore, it is also a potential defensive, it will build a defensive mechanism against other type of antibiotics. So antibiotics, these are the three things they do. Then um, here, these are just few facts. Antibiotics do not work against non-bacterial infection. Okay, remember we have viruses, we have uh, parasites, we have fungi, we have bacteria, okay? Antibiotics, they never work against non-bacterial infection. That is infections caused by viruses like COVID, like COVID-19, uh, infections caused by COVID-19, Ebola, those are, you know, these are viral infections. Antibiotics never work against them. No matter the, 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 the magnitude of, of uh, antibiotics that you pop in and take, it will never work against them. So they are specifically designed to attack bacteria. So that's one thing about antibiotics. Antibiotics can be broad spectrum or narrow spectrum. What we mean by broad spectrum is um, they can work against, there are some antibiotics that are designed in such a way that they can work against all type of, anti, or, of bacteria, either gram positive or gram negative. But when it is narrow spectrum, some of them, they only work against special type of, uh, maybe um, streamlined kind of uh, action against maybe gram positive alone or gram negative alone. Just like what I said initially, if you use a narrow spectrum antibiotic that is specifically designed to work against gram negative, against a gram positive organism, it will not work. And you, you think you, everybody will be saying, oh, the uh, antibiotic resistance has occurred. Yes, it will occur because that antibiotics are only designed for a particular group of, of uh, bacteria. So these are the things we have to put in mind and understand. Uh, some of the antibiotics react against bacteria based on their gram. I've mentioned this earlier. For example, uh, vancomycin. Vancomycin strictly works against gram positive bacteria. So if somebody with an infection who does not know, who has not gone for gram positive test, okay, have an infection and use vancomycin, and unfortunately the infectious agent is a gram negative bacteria, unfortunately it will not work. So that is one of the basics that are that are vancomycin will never work against gram negative organisms. Um, also, uh, macrolides. This is a group of the antibiotics, they will never work. Most of them work against um, gram positive bacteria, except enterococci. Enterococcus is also is a, is a kind of bacteria, uh, you know, uh, is a gram positive bacteria. Macrolide will not work against it. So we have to know which one does not work, which one work against what. So these are the matrices. These are, these are the matrices, you know, when it comes to antibiotic resistance. But then, if you don't know, it's better to just submit to those who know. 
and you know go to your doctors and get prescriptions instead of popping in antibiotics, which eventually will cause havoc in the long run. So another one is penicillin. Penicillin G antibiotics they are not active against gametic bacteria. No matter how much you use, they will never work against it. So um, I'm trying to be fast about this now. How do antibiotics really, really work against bacteria? Number one is they interfere with the cell wall synthesis. If you look at the diagram number one here, they, that's, um, for every bacteria cell, there is a cell wall, okay? So in, against that cell wall, um, some antibiotics are designed in such a way that they attack that cell wall, okay? Uh, another one is inhibition of function, membrane function. Uh, if you look at this diagram right now, um, this is the cell membrane with the hydrophobic um, structure, okay? So it doesn't, uh, some of reason, we open up the space, open up this space so that once you open it up, the antibiotics can flow inside or the, the content of the cell will pop out. That is lysis. It results in you know, the death of that bacteria. So uh, some of them target cell wall, some target uh, cell membrane. Another one is the one that interfere with the nucleic acid, that is the DNA or the RNA uh, replication. Also, inhibition of protein synthesis. We also have metabolic pathways and uh, then ATP synthesis. So uh, if you look at this side of the slide, I've actually uh, highlighted some of them. The ones that attack protein synthesis, they are different. This is a group of them. The ones that attack cell wall, we have cephalosporin, carbapenems, glycopeptides, uh, folates, pathway inhibitors, we have saponamides. Then DNA replication inhibitors, we have chloroquinolones. So if you don't, uh, that is why it is not just good to just take antibiotics. You just go to the uh, counter and buy antibiotics because you don't know which work against which organism. You don't know the pathway. You don't know the, 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 the process of, uh, sorry, the, the, the mechanism. Yes, so you cannot just, it, it is very wrong to just go buy antibiotics, okay? Because like I said, it has an adverse effect in the long run. Uh, how do many of the antibiotics work? Uh, oh, sorry, how do these organisms now resist? Uh, they do target site modification, antibiotics that are meant to target a particular site. Once these antibiotics, uh, probably as maybe the organism are used to these antibiotics, as a way they develop, they try to modify where it will attack. For example, the one that was supposed to attack cell membrane, they quickly develop some kind of coverage, you know, in such a way that the only the antibiotics will not be able to reach that site so that it will not be able to modify. So these are the mechanisms they employ. Another one, the common one is efflux pump, which I have the diagram there. Okay. So when the antibiotics are coming like this, uh, instead for you to work within the cells, they create a, a portal and expel it. You know, it's like, just like you take hot water, and when the hot water is very hot, you quickly spill it out. Yes, that is a scorcher, that is efflux pump. Okay, so once they take it inside, they quickly expel, they have the mechanisms within the cells that make them expel these antibiotics. So this is also one of the mechanisms. And another very important one is uh, uh, biofilm formation. Yes, biofilm formation. Um, they try to, you know, produce, our, you know, some materials that cover their cells. You know, they kind of create an umbrella. You just imagine you uh, under the rain and you decide to use an umbrella. Yes, so biofilm is a kind of umbrella, okay? It's kind of structural material, but I'm, I'm trying to liken it to umbrella because of those that are listening to me right now who are not science oriented. Uh, it is a kind of coverage that stops the access to antibiotics. Okay, so when you use antibiotics against this particular group of organisms, they produce biofilm. So the biofilm will not allow the antibiotics to get to them. So these are one of the ways they get to resist antibiotics. Okay, so yes, I decided to put this particular diagram for us to have a general knowledge of what, of how it works, antibiotics, stepwise process, how it actually happens. So if you look at diagram number one here, there are, this is a cell that, that contains um, ground, that contains bacteria. Okay, so the, the, the organisms that are blue in color, these are normal, normal bacteria that are not resistant. 
but the ones with the orange color are the ones that are resistant naturally because they develop some kind of resistance only over time. Yes, so you can see the population, they are not much, but they are, they are also in the same environment with the ones that are not resistant, okay? And when you, when you use antibiotics, maybe you use antibiotics to clear the infection, uh, the antibiotics will kill the ones that are not resistant. You can see the diagram too. The ones that are not resistant, they are dead or their, their, their growth has been inhibited. While the ones that are resistant are the ones that are remaining in that cell, okay? So it doesn't stop there. What, what happens? They begin to multiply in stage three, look at it. They begin to multiply. After all, you have killed the ones that are you know, competing with them, those ones are done. So they now have the full grasp of that particular environment and they begin to multiply. They multiply, so they do not just multiply alone. Even when new organisms are now coming up, maybe those that are not resistant, the new, you know, new lives are coming up, they begin to transfer what make them resistant into the newly up upcoming organisms. So that is the process of antibiotic resistance. That is that is just a, a, a picture uh, of how it happens. Um, okay. Looking at the case of AMR uh, and the problem that we are facing right now, I try to say, okay, how did we actually end up here? Um, use in human and animal medicine, you know, a lot of people misuse antibiotics. Um, they used to increase growth of farm animals. Yes, a lot of uh, animal farm, you must have heard from, maybe many of you have heard about this, but uh, I'm sure quite a number of people do not, have not or have not really come across this. So use of it, they use antibiotics, they mix with food, with the feed, the animal feed, to in, in order to increase the growth of the animals. But they are doing this, yes, they, with a positive mindset in view, but unfortunately it has a repercussion because we are predisposing, pre-exposing these, these uh, animals, in, we are pre-exposing them to antibiotics, either in low concentration or in higher concentration. So the bacteria that are inherent in them, are exposed already. And before you know it, they are beginning to develop the system. Okay, uh, look at the, the third one, which is used for routine treatment in humans and animal farm. When we say routine treatment, for example, many people just use antibiotics. We call it prophylactic, prophylaxis. Okay, in the case of prophylaxis, they use antibiotics, not because there is an infection, but just because you just want to pro protect them. Because you just want to, and human beings also do this. Even when they are not sick, they use antibiotics. They just want to protect themselves. You know, I, 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 time enough permits me to start mentioning a lot of incidences that we have seen, in, especially in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where people, you know, pack antibiotics in their bags and use it for some, you know, they use it um, in the, with the mindset that they are trying to protect themselves. Yes, uh, many people use it to prevent sex, uh, uh, infection after sex, and several other, other scenarios like that. So routine treatment is not as if there is infection, but just like you don't want infection. So let me just use it to protect myself against an infection that is not even here yet. So it's a very, very bad practice. It is done in farm animals. It's also used in human, human health care. I mean, humans do this. And also look at over and all on that prescription of antibiotics. When you over prescribe or when, when someone prescribes, maybe a quack prescribes, uh, antibiotics, and it, 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 um, I, I have what you need. It, it, it also has a way that it you know, stores in the, in the tissue, stores in the system, and also make it readily available for bacteria to pick it up and they become resistant. Lastly is um, self-medication. Self, uh, uh, let me just jump to the next slide. Okay, so what can you and I do to resist, I'm sorry, to, to, to come to reduce the spread. Like I said, you cannot stop AMR, but how can we reduce the spread of our AMR or antibiotic resistance specifically? Um, always visit or ask your doctor for advice. Um, don't assume based on symptoms. Many people, once they see symptoms, oh, these symptoms looks like malaria. The next thing you are buying anti malaria. You're not even going to the hospital to go test. Okay, so don't be so used to symptoms. I know these symptoms. Once I'm beginning to have fever, I'm headache, I think it is typhoid. 
I think it is this, and you're beginning to buy and stop. So that's a very bad practice. Um, say no to self -medica medication. Then um, this is a this is a very major one that we are still battling with across the um, Africa, across Africa, I and mean, some part of the world at large. Buying drugs over the counter without just doctor's prescription. I just hope this law is uh, you know implemented. This policy is implemented across board. Do not share your drug with someone else. Do not keep drugs in the house for future use. Always finish the course of your drugs that has been prescribed by physician. Then this is another one which I know the practice is not so common. Once doctor prescribes drugs for you and you finish the course of the drug, you're done with it. But the many ones, the actual practice, the normal practice is that you return all unfinished drugs to the pharmacy. But I'm sure you know, we don't do it. Yes, uh, yes, a lot of countries don't even do this, but this is the actual, this is the right way around it. Then uh, talking about personal hygiene, um, wash hands, um, you know, wash your hands regularly before and after handling or um, and preparing food. After visiting the convenience, you know, that's the, the, the restroom. Then another thing is this one, I decided to highlight it because it is something I have found out but it's a lot of people, it has not been documented basically. If you are an antibiotics medication, this is from open defecation or urination. The reason is because when you take antibiotics, uh, I don't know many of us must have actually experienced it, that when you take antibiotics, the urine starts to smell and you even can perceive antibiotics in your urine. So which means that this urine is not, this antibiotics is not uh, totally metabolized, okay? So the urine you pass out as urine in the environment, in the open, open surface, open field or defecation, they are so therapeutic in, 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 in nature, uh, in their microgram, in their concentration. So they will also breed, organisms are exposed to it in the soil where you, where you pee. Yes, so organisms will also keep developing resistance to it. So these are natural processes that also increase the rate of antibiotic resistance. Then um, reduce the spread of infections through vaccination. Yes, I know vaccination is actually on that way in many countries right now. Then lastly, make a difference by sharing with many others about AMR. Share what you know, tell people about it. And uh, if you look at this, this young boy, yeah, this is a boy, a, 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 a picture a young boy in Africa, okay, saying the future of antibiotics you know, depends on you. Protect this guy, let he becomes a victim of antibiotic resistance. Okay, protect the, the, the people around you as well by doing your own part. Okay, and lastly, um, I decided to add this one also, which says, What doesn't kill you, it mutates and comes back. So, the antibiotics that you don't take care of, I mean, a bacteria that are exposed to antibiotics, maybe a, a, a little dose of antibiotics. They would, that, that, would, that did not die is if you go back and go and get ready and come back for you. So when we take these practices into more into place, in place, we will not fall victim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lekosin. Um okay. So um, at this point in time, I'm going to open up for questions. You could raise your hand. Or you could um, uh, type in the chat room. So, any questions? Yes, Faye. Good, good evening, Dr. Oluwatosin. Thank you so much for the lecture. My You're question welcome. is You talked on plasmid, and I wanted to ask what are plasmids and how do they transfer the resistant genes? Okay, thank, thank. can I quickly answer that? Okay, let me just quickly say, uh, plasmids are, you know, we call them extra chromosomal DNA. You know, um, we have chromosomes, okay? Um, I'm trying to use the simple term I can use now. Um, chromosomes are part of human cells, human gene, genomics, okay? So when it's about genomes, we have the ones that are, based in the chromosome, and we now have the ones that are not on the chromosome. Okay, so plasmid is just a kind of DNA, 
okay, that is not part of your chromosome, or, sorry, not part of the bacterial chromosome, but they are also a kind of DNA that are found in the cytoplasm inside the organism itself. Okay, they are found in the bacteria, but they are not in the, they are not part of the chromosome. Okay, so there are, it is easy to transport it because it's a complete genome on its own. So like I said, during maybe during uh, conjugation, you can easily pass it across to the next organism. So that is what plasmid is a DNA, but it is not part of the original DNA of that particular bacteria. It is just something they pick up in the environment, plasmids. So that's plasmid. It's an extra chromosomal DNA. I hope I'm able to explain that well. Thank you so much, Doctor. You're welcome. Okay, I'm glad that was explained. Thank you very much, Dr. Lettison. Um, yes, Dauda. Okay, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Lettison, for giving us thank this you. wonderful presentation. Um, my question goes thus. Um, in our last class, we learned that um, we have different type of um, bacteria. So we have some bacteria that they are normal flora in our body. They help us in, in maybe digestion and the likes. So um, when you were talking about how antimicrobial resistance occur in general, you made sure you mentioned of about um, antimicrobials, let's say antibiotics specifically, they work based on target sites. So these um this bacteria has some specific specific um let's see, substance that these antibiotics are targeting on them. So my question is that um, you, you, you said there that um, in some cases, in most cases, even the good bacteria, which are the normal bacteria, are also killed. So is it that the specificity of um, antibiotics is not that kind of, that kind of um, um, accurate in the sense that it also kills the, the good bacteria? Like, doesn't it have a specific things that is checking on the, like, the bad bacteria? like to differentiate okay. between, okay, this is a bad bacteria and this is a good bacteria. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, Th thank you for that question. Uh, I was happy to uh, answer that. Yes, uh, when it comes to drugs, basically, uh, you know, when drugs are produced, yeah, they, there's high level of specificity. Yes, um, so most of the specific uh, antibiotics now, they, they, when they say specificity, yes, some of them, for example, those are targets, uh, maybe they just target the, Cell, cell membrane, for example, they, they don't, okay, or let me put it this way. When you have, let's say you have E. coli, the Shericia coli, which is a common antibody, common gametic organism, okay? Let's say you have an E. coli that is not, that is susceptible, but that is not, uh, as a normal flora, and is not causing uh, infection, and you have another one in the same environment that is actually the causative agent of that infection. Some antibiotics, may not be able to differentiate which one is the E. coli that is causing antibiotic, causing infection, which one is the E. coli that is not causing infection, but it directly goes for E. coli. There are some antibiotics like actually the broad spectrum ones. Yes, most of, especially the broad spectrum, they target organisms that fall in line, and allow that, you know, that fall in that particular target. Yes, uh, when it comes to specificity, um, I think the specificity when it um, that should be it faces there are there are other subjects of specificity, but it doesn't really address most of the time address which organism, um, you know, in the same group, for example, maybe like I said, E. coli, e. coli one, E. coli two, one is causing infection, the other one is not causing infection. But once antibiotics come in, they clear all the, if not all, most of the E. coli that are there. Okay, so some antibiotics are designed that way, especially also when you are doing combination therapy. Maybe um, ampicillin cannot, we after doing um, diagnostics and they figure out, okay, uh, ampicillin might not be able to take care of this alone. They decide to add, maybe, for example, tanzobactam or tanzobactam piperacillin combination. Those kind of antibiotics. They, they, they might not be too specific, you know, to look out for which one particularly. So they just go there, take care of the organisms that are there. So that is the case. So it actually varies also, but that is what happens most of the time. 
So um, I don't know if you have heard about probiotics before, probiotics, prebiotics, just uh, another subject entirely. But what probiotics, I just simply keep it in that probiotics are now designed, they are food materials, naturally occurring food materials that you know the are being advised that once you use antibiotics, use these probiotics. Okay, this type of food like yogurt is a kind of probiotics. Use this kind of so that it will bring back those organisms that have been cleared away, but they were supposed to be helpful in your system. But unfortunately, antibiotics has cleared them away. So you are supposed to take probiotics in order to balance it again. Okay, that is probiotics. Like I said, it's a different topic entirely. So I hope I'm able to answer that question. Yes, sir. Thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so on to our next question. I see that this session is very interesting. We have a lot of questions for you, Dr. Watson. So <laughs> yes, Winnie. Uh, Winnie, please and ask your question. I wish the people who are in the chat room after. All right. Thank you so much, Doctor, for this brilliant presentation. Um, so my question is. So um, if I understand all what you've said perfectly, um, no matter how cautious we are about antibiotic resistance, it still remains inevitable because even if we follow our doctor's prescription, even if we prevent self-medication, we'll still have to use antibiotics at some point, like in prophylaxis before surgery, these things are like unavoidable. So we can only try to prevent the fast rate of resistance, but we can never actually stop resistance. We're just trying to push resistance ahead in a certain generation in the future. So my question is, there's going to be a generation in the future that is going to experience full-blown resistance. Is that correct, sir? Yeah, I think, um, yes, I, I want to agree with you partially. Yes, because uh, that is if, if uh, like what you said, we are not trying to stop AMR. We are trying to reduce the spread of AMR, okay? And if the old world, for example, comes together and we all cooperate and try as much as possible. Maybe that generation you're talking about, yes, we, we meet the, the, the normal um, rates, maybe not the full blown rate. If the trend continues like that, if everybody keeps taking care of and being careful, maybe if we continue to pass that character, that uh, you know trend across from one generation to another. Maybe that generation might not even experience a full blown. That is why I, I just want to, I don't want to totally agree with that. So, so in a case where that generation actually experienced full blown resistance, it means like most people in that era are going to die. Most, if not uh, all. It, it, well, we are praying it will not get there, but it eventually happens. Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, there have been cases where people even die as a result of just cutting their leg, cut, maybe grass cut. Yes, and because there's no, yes, yeah, we have seen cases like that, you know, in, in, the, in Germany, where uh, I think that was even one of the guys, one of the Adolf Hitler kind of, you know, his troop, one of the members, you know, he got caught in the leg with just grass. And because of that, because there was no treatment to take care of him, and all the antibiotics they used did not work. He died eventually. So okay. yes, if it continues that way, that might be the case. But we are trying as much as possible. Everybody's trying to be responsible so that we will not get to that particular point. All right. Thank you so much, Doctor. I'm very grateful. Thank you. OK. What's an interesting thought. And I think that will uh, warrant more discussion amongst all of us, the ambassadors, and you know, other people reach out to talk about the MR. So yes, um, Nabula, please you can unmute. And ask you. Yes, Nabula. Hello, doctors in the audience. I'm so glad with the presentation of today. I have a question, and my question is, one day I hear that the microorganism can, uh, can attain or can have a resistance properties 
when exposed to heavy metals in the soil. So um, I'm asking to, 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 to the presenter that, that how do microorganisms can, 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 can have this property from the heavy metal and the, how do we or, or how can we overcome this situation as we are trying to fight for, 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 for this campaign of, of preventing the of preventing or giving awareness to the people in issue about resistance, antibiotic resistance. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, to start with, I think I will talk about the awareness. Uh, most of the awareness that I've been seeing you know, across Africa uh, as a continent uh, are bas basically healthcare centered. If you look at it, human healthcare centered or animal healthcare centered, and many people have not really like go talk about the environment, how environments, you know, how we, what we do, what our practices in the environment, how they promote antibiotic, antibiotic resistance. For example, I made mention of herbicides, heavy metals. Yes. It, 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 people keep using herbicides, but they don't even know the, that the components of herbicides are pesticides, the chemical pesticide and herbicides. The, the materials that are, that, are, that are chemicals that are used in producing these things, they, they trigger these organisms. They trigger their response because they are trying to defend themselves against these things. And in so doing, they, they are also priming themselves against any kind of antibiotics. Okay, so I think the awareness should take a next level and involve the environment. Yes, if that is put in place. And also maybe in, in uh, agriculture, I think agriculture also has been to be streamlined. People are talking about animal health mostly and not even talking about the you know, farming practices. That is also one thing that has to be you know, taken care of. The information has to get to them. Every metals, people still dump every metals in the environment. You know, when you go to dump sites, you see used laptops, use phones, these things they degenerate over time when they are exposed to, 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 uh, to, uh, to the environment, to water, they, they keep rusting. And these particular metal, um, uh, you know, um, trailings, when the organism are exposed to it, it acts, well, there's something we call co-selection. It acts as a co-selector for antibiotic resistance. So the awareness has to go full blown. We are not done there, we are not there yet across the globe. I want to believe that we are not there yet in terms of yeah, awareness. Um, yes, so but we, we keep uh, you know, educating ourselves. Thank you for the question, sir. Thank you, Doctor, for the, for the good answers. I'm satisfied with the answer. Okay, yes. I'm glad to hear that. Um, on to Joseph. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yes, you. Can be heard. Okay, thank you, Doctor, for your nice presentation. I'm Joseph Guzmana from Rwanda, and I'm yeah, currently a student in dental surgery, year five. Wow. Uh, basing on what, what you said during the presentation, uh, I've learned that like it's not good, really not good to use bacteria and uh, antibiotics to use antibiotics as prophylaxis. And then uh, this brought to me having like a confusion. Like we were always being told that like if we are receiving a patient uh, with poor uh, oral hygiene, and then we are planning to do like uh, uh, some treatment, like let's say like extraction of the tooth, which will uh, lead to like breathing. So if you are going, if you are planning to do uh, that treatment and uh, you can, you are seeing like oral hygiene is totally poor, not good at all. So they always like advise us to give uh, those antibiotics. Mainly we are using amoxicillin uh, as prophylaxis so that we can prevent the spread out of uh, those infection from oral cavity to a systemic way. Uh, so, basing on that, what can you uh, comment uh, about uh, that relating to the what we have learned through this presentation and the uh, 
that things I shared with you. My second okay. question is like, I've been hearing there are like there is there are two main groups which can class can we which we can use to classify uh, antibiotics. They are saying like some are bacteriostatic and others are bacteriocilo. Can you uh, comment on those two two terms uh, by giving which one is uh, good to use? If there is, if among those two, one is, uh, yeah, like comment which one is better than other. Okay. okay. Uh, and then the lastly, I would like like to to ask you if possible, can you share as like this presentation maybe via email or any means because. Uh, Okay. For example, for me, uh, I was been having like some troubles to join previous session. Maybe I'm, plan I'm, I'm thinking like maybe there are some other who didn't get chance to attend this good session. So if possible, you can share with us uh, the presentation via email. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, yeah, I have to be swift about it. Yeah, so the, uh, let me start from the first question, talking about the prophylaxis. Yeah, I think uh, prior to this time, because this is, this is like a wake, a wake up call, okay? Prior to this time, a lot of uh, this particular practice you make big mention of, which is the use of um, antibiotics to treat. In fact, I think I, I'm aware of the fact that the, uh, um, uh, dentists mm -hmm. use ant antibiotics, you know, to as a prophylactic treatment, you know, for oral then oral uh, maybe surgery, I say, especially when you notice that the patient has, is uh, has an oral, the oral uh, you know area is bad and probably well too infected, or um, as a, a a high bacterial load. Let me put it that way. Yes, it is actually supposed to be like that's where it has been, but I think in the beginning. Since AMR is beginning to, you know, the, the, the advent of AMR, a lot of, a lot of um, normal processes, or let me say what we used to term as normal processes, are beginning, people are beginning to review why do we have to continue this? Okay, why do we have to continue this? So one thing I think I want to say, I may not have the perfect answer to that question, but one thing I want to say is uh, as pre-exposure, pre-exposure of individuals or even the bacteria to antibiotics as a tendency. Yes, it might not be 100%. The, I, mean, I, mean, I may not say it's 100% cause antibiotic resistance, but it has a tendency, you know, to lead to antibiotic resistance. Because what if uh, there is no, uh, the organism is not, is actually resistant, Maybe by the time you even use, because you're not even sure that when you use amoxicillin, for example, that all the bacteria will die in that mouth cavity, in that mouth, uh, before you do the uh, surgery or before you take care of that dentist, um, before the dentist takes care of that patient. There is no 100% assurance that organisms, all organisms are eradicated. Okay. Um, I would like to know if. Uh, you do, let's say you do like bacterial tests before, and even after you have applied the ampicillin, do you still go ahead to do the test to be sure that all the organisms have been eradicated? I'm sure these practices are not so, uh, I'm not sure that is part of the practice. So what I'm trying to say in essence is, yes, prior to this time, that has been the normal thing. But a lot of people are beginning to review the curriculum now of different, um, you know, um, practices, especially pharmacy, um, dentistry, medical personnel, everybody is trying to review it. So I would say, I would advise that it is reviewed. Maybe there should be an alternative to taking care of something like that. Okay, maybe there should be an alternative because we know that if it continues that way, there will be development of antibody resistance because amoxicillin, yeah, like you said, you have not tested it. You are not even sure if the dosage you are using is not to take care of that particular organism. 
but it's just to prevent it. That's why we call it prophylaxis. So I think um, that should be reviewed by maybe the dentist association, or uh, I may not be able to have much to say about that. Then talking about bacteriostatic and bactericidal, yes, bacteriostatic, you understand the fact that when you use antibiotics, in the essence, the, the word bacteriostatic means that whatever antibiotics you use will inhibit the continuous growth of that bacteria. While if it is bactericidal, it will totally kill the organisms. Okay, so bacteriostatic doesn't mean it will, it will not kill the organism, but it will render them inactive. Okay, we render them, make them uh, unable to continue to, to reproduce. But in the case of cider, bactericida, it totally kills the, time, the organisms that are present. So it depends on what the, whoever is doing that aims, uh, sorry, wish to, uh, to achieve at the end of the day. So we, we remember, I mean, we see that people administer drugs for bacteriostatic reasons, some do for bactericidal reasons. So it depends on what they intend or whoever is doing that intends to achieve, okay? So uh, either ways can be used. It depends on who is doing what at that particular time. Then lastly, yes, I, I, I think I would love to share my, my slides. Uh, I'll talk, talk with um, the coordinator and have her. Yes, uh, I'll find a way to send my slides. So it's a very interesting question you have asked. Thank you very much, Joseph. Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. Okay, great. Um, like I said, there are very many questions, and uh, I think that is owed to your wonderful presentation, Doctor Watson. So, um, please, for next questions, let's try to um, explain them, but in a summarized way, so that uh, we can finish up all the. 20 questions that are left. Okay, yes, Nick, please unmute after your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So my name is Nick, I'm from Kenya. I had uh, three questions. Question one, uh, which, which, which group of uh, uh, bacteria exhibits high resistance ever since we came into the era of antimicrobial resistance. So which one exhibits and what are the particular reasons that we might attribute it to? So that we say that if maybe it's gram positive, it uh, throughout the generations we have seen it exhibits a lot of resistance because of A, B, C, D. Or if it's gram negative, it's because of A, B, C, D. And how is the pharmacological industry also involved? <clears throat> and that one also ties to question two. What is this cycle of resistance? Because maybe we perhaps have first generation, second generation drugs, third generation, and we realize that the bacteria that in, was intended for first generation, yes, there are those uh, 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 genetic changes, those mutations that happen so that they exhibit. And also there is a response from the pharmacological world. So what is this cycle of resistance and how far have, uh, have we gone? How uh, uh, maybe perhaps in terms of mechanism and also to the best of your knowledge, uh, how far have we gone? Then the third question and the last one is that uh, in terms of antimicrobial stewardship and resistance, how is the setup currently? Uh, and, 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 and what are we really doing in terms, especially microbiological scientists, so that we, we, we as much as we will not uh, completely eliminate it, we reduce it. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Nick, uh, for the question. Uh, I would like to first of all start from the very first one, talking about gram positive or gram negative, like which one and why are they more, uh, if there's any record of which one is more prevalent and why are they like that? Okay, um, uh, if you look at um, WHO priority list, uh, they, there are a group of organisms on the WHO priority list and they are categorized in the in group of, you see, critical or let me say highly critical kind of organisms. And you see 
Inga or the critical um, like mid, then you see um, less critical. I'm just trying to paraphrase. Okay, so if you look at that, if you have access to that particular WHO list of organisms, you will see that most of the organisms that are featured there are mostly gram-negative organisms. In fact, they are mostly enterobacterial C, the likes of the, the group of organisms that are majorly featured at the enterobacterial C. And if you look at the enterobacterial C, look at the number of the type of organisms that is that featured on in, in bacteria C, you see the most like, you see the coliforms where you have the enter or mostly enteric organisms that live in the human gods. Okay, or let me say human god, animal and human gods. Okay, so these are the ones that have basically, you know, um, been identified mostly as, you know, critical organisms, critical resistant. Like we have uh, carbapenem resistant, enterobacteriaceae, you have the likes of uh, uh, SK or SKP, as the case may be. If you look at that particular SK, SK is a, is a short form, it's an acronym for um, enterobacter, uh, I think Enterobacter, Sal Salmonella, and many of them like that, Klebsiella, okay, including Pseudomonas. Yes, Pseudomonas, then you have E. coli as, as part of them. But then there is Enterococcus among them, yes, which is the only gram positive that was featured, if I'm, if I'm right, uh, if I'm right. So we, most of them are enteric organisms. They are organisms that live in the gut of them, they have direct, you know, um, they, 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 they are, you can call some of them, you can even call some of them normal flora. For example, when there is open defecation or um, fecal contamination, yes. For example, let me pick Salmonella. Salmonella is easy to pass to the next person. Salmonella, let's say, that causes, Salmonella causes typhoid, okay? It's easy to pass to the next person through fecal oral routes, okay? That is, um, when feces is passed and maybe the hand is not washed, and it goes to the mouth of the next person. So that cycle, though, these are the group of organisms that are mostly featured. And because they are the ones that mostly cause uh, infection. So they are, like I said, they are enteric organisms found in the human system. They are easily associated with humans. They are easily associated with, uh, for example, if you see E. coli outside, you're gonna be wondering there must have been defecation somewhere. If you see Salmonella outside uh, in the soil, it's, you want to start thinking that it is indicative that somebody just passed a scritter somewhere because it is mostly found in the, in the gut, in the system. And they are also easily found in the earth care environment as well. Okay, um, they are the ones that are easily found in infection, uh, you know, hospital cases, so to say. So I think these are part of the factors. It is not, uh, I would not say it is in, uh, of course, we have, we also have cases of, star, of uh, Vancomycin resistant uh, or MRSA, where you have the methicillin resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus, which is a gram positive organism. I wouldn't say there is a particular trend, you know, uh, group of organisms per se, but each organism have also developed, or let me say, display some importance, display some infectious rate of infection. So these are, I've mentioned there are some gram, gram positive, are, but mostly now, are the gram negative organisms, mostly which are enteric organisms found in the human, uh, found to be associated with human and animals. So that might be because in most of the cases that we have also seen in the hospitals, um, these gram negative organisms have been, you know, um, found mostly. Uh, there's another one uh, which is uh, Asnetobacter baumani, it's also very, very rampant these days. So it's a gram negative organism. So most of the cases I've been seeing are gram-negative organisms. I might not be able to tell that this is exactly why we are seeing more gram-negative than gram-positive, but the truth is the enteric organisms are well represented in the number of organisms that are seen out there as agents that are resistant to antibiotics. Then talking about, I think I didn't get your second question, but let me jump to your last question, which is talking about a stewardship. Yes, yeah, stewardship flows from you know individuals. These are individual responsibilities. That is, what do you do in your own field of study, in your own area? How do you practice? What are the practices 
that are put in place to reduce the spread of antibiotic resistance. As an environmentalist, in, in China, as an environmental microbiologist, there are, there are things we put in place individually that are conscious, we are in the consciousness of what we do so that we also you know, increase the practice. Like stewardship doesn't stop at your own personal practice. The awareness is also a part of stewardship. Yes, how much awareness do you make? How much do you tell people? How much publications have gone out there? How much uh, awareness campaign have you, been, have you done? So these are the areas of stewardship. It doesn't only mean that you have to, even doctors, medical doctors as well, they also have roles to play. A part of the medical doctor stewardship is you tell your patient, a patient is forcing you, you must give me uh, antibiotics. Yes, there are patients that tell their doctors they want antibiotics. It is the duty as a steward to tell the patient that you are not supposed to, sorry, uh, we'll be managing you, on, you know, you just need to take rest, explain to them why they don't need antibiotics. So this is part of the stewardship. Stewardship is open-ended. Yes, stewardship is open-ended. You just have to understand what role you want to play and take your own part of the campaign and do it, do justice to it. So, um, like I said, I am unable to answer your second question, but then uh, I just hope I've done justice to this once I've, I've done. Nick. Okay, thank you so much. It's no problem. Maybe we'll still answer it in the course of okay. Uh, okay. the program. Um, sorry, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very thank much. You. Okay, um, so next we're going to have Mohammed and then Adrian. And after which, I'll rush through a few of the questions in the chat room. Okay, thank you, Dr. Oluwatosin, for the wonderful presentation. So I have a quick question on your on your slide. You made mention of some bacteria that react against um, um some antibiotics that react against bacteria based on gram staining, and you made an example of um microlide, which acts against gram positive bacteria, but there was an exception of Enterococci. So I don't understand. Does enterococci is an is enterococci a gram negative bacteria or is it a special kind of gram positive bacteria? I want some little clarification on that. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank you very much for your Wait. question. Um, as for yeah, macrolide is actually macrolide. Yeah, look at macrolide. It's actually one of the yeah. antibiotics. actually one of the antibiotics <clears throat> that you know. Um, is active on um, sorry the mode of uh, mode of mode of um, action is basically to attack the ribosome okay because it's actually an uh, is is on is actually involved in amino acid breakdown yes so uh, I think by natural design it is meant to attack gram positive organisms but there are features in the enter in the enter there are features in their in their cellular, comp uh, cellular uh, compartments, okay, in the cellular machinery, let me put it that way, there are some setups in their systems that do not allow macrolides to penetrate to work on them. Yeah, so it's a systematic kind of advancement, which makes it so different from all that kind of gram positive organisms. So we are right when we say macrolides attack gram positive organisms, yes, only, but with the exception of enterococci. Yes, because the way they are designed, the way the cellular setup is, it does not allow the inflow, it does not allow the interaction of with macro life. So that is just the only difference. Okay, thank you very much, sir, for the answer. Thank you for the question, too. I'm happy to answer. Hello, Adrian. Can you, can you still hear us?
Oh, hello, doctor. Yes, um, my name John, is right? yes, my name is John from Kenya. I You're wanted welcome. to ask a question: Does genetically modified organism increase the chances of antimicrobial resistance? Okay, um, thank you. When you say when you talk about GMOs, uh, GMOs are modified for a particular purpose. Yes, so. Uh, if, I don't know for, it depends on what they are modified to do. So when you say modification, um, talking about GMOs, like I said, they actually modify for a particular purpose. So the, whoever is modified, generally they are not even allowed. Yeah, I think uh, there are no, not every country, not every institute allow GMOs to be released into the environment, to be released, you know, for consumption, except they must have done a lot you know, uh, it must have passed through some, um, you know, policymakers and, you know, must have passed through a lot of, um, uh, how I call it now, some established um, people that would probe it, so to say, before it is released. So they must, they, they must have probably put that in their, con in their consideration, you know, before they allow GMOs. In fact, some countries don't even allow GMOs these days. So, because, if it is modified to do one thing, and this alteration, it's possible that the alteration will alter some genetic materials and make the organism to also keep um, you know, resist antibiotics. It's possible if it is not well, if if it is not well, you know, worked on. So before the GMOs are released to the environment, there are several tests that are done on these GMOs. There are a lot of examination that are done on GMOs before they allow them. So. Number one thing is it is possible for GMOs to also uh, you know, increase the rate of, sorry, it is possible for GMOs to become resistant to antibiotics after it has been modified, it is possible. But if regulatory agencies have put, they've done the necessary things, it's possible it might not be. And meanwhile, don't let's not forget the fact that in the genetic components of organisms, microorganisms generally, there are a lot of genomes Okay, we call them uh, mobilons. There are a lot of mobile genetic elements that are naturally, act, uh, you know, active there. I don't know. I don't. Know, I, don't I didn't want to go into genomics. I don't really want to go into genomics. But there are so many things in the genome that are naturally just take place. For example, I don't know if you have heard about insertion sequences. You know, jumping genes. These are uh, mechanisms that happen naturally inside the organisms that might cause resistance even in the later time. But I, like I said, I don't, I don't want to go into genomes. Yeah, so GMOs have the tendency to cause to become resistant if they are if they are not regulated. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, it's, uh, you had, uh, sir, please, you said it is necessary to return unfinished drugs to the pharmacy. Please, could you tell us why? Uh, sorry, I didn't get that question, please. Please, you said that it was necessary, that it is necessary to return finished drugs to the pharmacy. Please, could you tell us why? Okay, um, thank you. Let me just, yeah. The reason is because you don't keep, it is not, as part of the stewardship you're talking about, it is not good enough to keep antibiotics in your house after you are done, after you have pleased the cost of the antibiotics, you have done, you have used, used, you have used the one uh, prescribed. Maybe you were supposed to use three, um, let's say like, let's say six tablets in the long run, but in your previous sachets, you have like 10, 10, 10, 10, and you have many things. You, you, ordinarily, you're not supposed to keep it in the house. Yes, because, because if you keep it in the house, somebody else can think they have the same kind of ailment and can go there later and pick it up and use, even without prescription. So it is one of the practices that we try to try to come against. We don't keep 
I'm not supposed to keep it in the house. That's number one. Then uh, returning it back to the pharmacy is just a kind of stewardship also. You know, it's just, it's just a way to, so that you don't have access to it. You don't, you're not supposed to have access to antibiotics carelessly, freely. Yes, in the well, in the UK, for example, I'm very sure in the UK, you don't buy antibiotics without prescription. And if you have, they will give you exactly what you have, the, this prescription is. And once you have finished it, definitely you, have, you don't have the leftover to keep. So, but you know, in Nigeria, in Africa, many people buy and you buy SS. Of course, there's no prescription. You buy SS and keep in the house. So we can actually use, other people can come and pick it up and use. Maybe, of course, when you have antibiotics, you feel like you are safe. You, see, you feel like you are preserved. You can use it anytime you like. So these are the practices. We're just trying to remove, reduce the access to it. That's why you say it's better to return it back to pharmacy. In fact, if you return it, if it is well regulated, you get your money back. You get reward. Yes, you get reward for returning it. That's another way to do it. Um, let me just quickly keep this in Germany. When you use, when you drink, um, you take drinks with plastics. When you return it back to where you bought it from, you're going to get some heroes in, in Germany. It's a practice that is ongoing right now. So this practice can also be implemented here too. When you return your antibiotics, maybe you get some money back or you get something back to your reward. It also be an encouragement. So that is you just to keep AMR low, reduced to BRS minimum. So it's not like it is well, it is well published as a, as a but then we are looking at how can we have what can we can what can be done. So that's why we are bringing it to the table. Thank you very much, Dr. Watosin. Um, so before we continue, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I know we are way over time, 36 minutes past. And so I'm wondering if you have a little more time or um, because the remaining questions are in the chat, I could collect them and, and send them to you. Um, so do you have some more time or? Yes, I, I, I'm, uh, yes, because where I am, I have to, I'm actually in the facility yeah. where I work in, in India right now. So I need, I'm very soon to have to lock this facility so I can go home. So um, what I'm saying in essence is, let questions keep coming. Um, in, you, know, you can forward them to my email. Definitely, I will respond, and they will get to the respective persons that have asked these questions. OK. Uh, thank you so much. Once again, for your time, thank you for, I think you can see that uh, your presentation um, it was really amazing. You. you have so many questions coming on a lot of different aspects on AMR. So thank you very much for that. So one thing thank I'm going to do is much. I'm going to collect the question. Yeah, I'm going to collect the questions in the chat room and uh, put them in a document and send them to you. Or yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for yes. all thank for you. this time yeah. and going yes, that yeah. evening. It's okay. always my pleasure to talk about AMR. <laughs> Yeah, and thank, thank you to all participants. You so I had a good time talking to everybody as well. Thank you so, so much.